area. Uh, with all respect, I welcome you, sir, for the inaugural webinar uh, talk. Now, I invite, I would like to invite our uh, principal, Dr. Raina Thomas, for a very short inauguration of the lecture series. And after that, you can listen to Professor Naina Sajid Phillips' uh, talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Uh, Reina Thomas, Principal, Marthama College, Chungatera, to inaugurate the FITEX series, uh, webinars, uh, lecture series. Thank you, Shilu. I'm audible? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, very good morning to you all. One minute, sorry, one minute. Okay, welcome back. Good morning to all, dear friends, participants, uh, head of the department, Dr. Jay Prakash, uh, the Chief guest of this day, Dr. Nainan Sajid Philip. Our physics department is in the 25th year of its journey. I appreciate the head of the department and faculty for their initiative and effort in organizing this webinar series. As we all know, the COVID 19 is a pandemic which respect as from all type of uh, activities. And we are transforming it into an infodemic where we can acquire knowledge sitting at home. So I am happy to inaugurate this webinar series, the first lecture uh, on astronomy by Dr. Nainan Sajid Phillips, sir. I appreciate the participants' efforts. Make it useful and be benefited by this webinar series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, teacher. Thank uh, you. Now, I invite uh, Dr. Nainan Sajid Philip, uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, for delivering the talk. Uh, uh, sir, uh, uh, he was an um, assistant uh, uh, associate professor at uh, St. Thomas College, Corinjeri, and he is actually my uh, uh, guide. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to invite you, sir, uh, for this talk. Uh, is the screen visible now? Yes, sir. Yes, 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 sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, good morning to all of you. For the next 45 minutes to an hour, I'll try to introduce you to some of the recent developments in modern astronomy and its application to different areas. <clears throat> Most of the work discussed here were done by my students and I'm only presenting them. Uh, sir, uh, you have a Oh, yes. Okay. 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 Uh, so the title of my talk is when nature becomes the laboratory. And I'll be mostly discussing this in the light of modern astronomy research that is happening in various parts of the country and abroad. <coughs> so why I say nature becomes a laboratory, I'll explain that in a few minutes. This is one of the missions that was carried out by United Emirates last Sunday, the 19th of July, 2020. It is called the Hope Mission, and it is a mission to Mars on a Japanese rocket. The mission is to take about seven months to reach Mars, which is our nearest neighbor. And this planet is at a distance of about 500 million kilometers from us. So you see how distant our nearest neighbor is. 
it takes seven months for us to reach there. And even with very dedicated, specific mission services like costing lots of money also. <clears throat> so that points us to the real challenges in astronomy. The major challenge is that it is practically impossible to go even to our nearest neighbors to do real time studies. The lab that nature provides is remote and we have no control over them. In fact, we are passive observers with no facility for interactive studies. For example, I show here the image of NGC 3423 galaxy. There is a box shown there. And once on a blue moon in 2009, suddenly there appeared a bright object on that box, in that box. And that is a supernova. Supernova is an exploding star at its end of life. And this supernova is named SN 2009 LS. The thing is, as I said, we have no control or knowledge when supernova will be formed. The astronomer has to wait until it happens and immediately point his telescopes to do the follow up observations. So this is the real challenge that is not existing in other branches of physics or chemistry or whatever branch of science you think of, where you have control on the experiment. You don't have a control stand, uh, control here on what is going to happen and when it is going to happen. So you have uncertainty in both time, space, and also your proximity to the particular event. Now let us consider the distance to this particular object. NGC 3423 is at a distance of approximately 4.6 into 10 raised to 7 light years from us. That means the supernova that is that you observed in 2009 burst in the galaxy about 4.6 into 10 raised to 7 years ago, which is perhaps before even the Earth became habitable. So even before life existed on this planet, this event has been happening. And because of the distance from us, it took us so many years to wait till 2009 to see this event happen. Let us look at our nearest star, which is Alpha Century. In fact, there is a, this is a binary of Alpha Century A and B stars, which with a center of gravity around which they both rotate in a period of about 80 years. And this is the nearest star we have other than Sun, which is, of course, our host star. How far it is? It is at a distance of about 4.22 light years, <clears throat> which means that even for the light or even for doing an observation that is happening in our nearest star, there is a delay of about 4.22 light years, which is a great delay when compared to the things even in the COVID-19 scenario, we are talking about months as long periods, but this is years that we have to think of. So what is to be, what I want to tell you is that all that is known is the past. There is no way to know the future. And there is not even any way to know the present of the universe. So everything that we know is from the past. And we have to work out on that to understand the evolution of the universe and the way it has evolved to the point where we are now. So it turns out that everything that we understand or we know is from the light that is received from these celestial bodies. So I have to say that astronomy research is limited to the information carried by night radiations coming from the stars. We'll have one more handle to work with this scenario when gravitational detectors becomes reliable and available. But that's a long story and a long way to go. Since light is the only available information, 
let us look at a few of the observables that are available when we do every study based on the light that is received. The main observation or the basic observation that is available is the intensity of the light that is coming from the object. And it obeys a 1 by r square law. What is this 1 by r square law? Because the area, the surface area, which is the wavefront that is coming from the light source, keeps on increasing its size by r square, by r square, you know, the radius of the circle and the circumference. Because the area of the surface increases by r square. As you move away with a distance of r, as shown in the figure, the area into which this light spreads increases to the square. And as a result, the intensity at any point or in any square decreases by 1 by r square the distance. So this is one of the limitations. And because of that reason, when the object is very far from you, the intensity of light, the visibility of the object becomes very less. And, and that is one of the challenges that astronomers face. And they talk about the magnitude of the particular object. And in fact, they talk about two types of magnitude, the apparent and the absolute magnitude, <clears throat> which is measured in the log scale as the amount of light or the flux that is coming from the particular object. So when the magnitude goes to small values, it is brighter. And when the magnitude goes to higher values, it is fainter. So the limiting magnitude for observing with the naked eye is about six which is a bright object. But the sky, the night sky in the darkest night is at a magnitude of about 20, which means that we can see only up to a limiting magnitude of 20 in the log scale. It is a minus log scale, in fact. I am not going into the details, but you can refer to it anywhere on basic astronomy books. So that is the magnitude to which the sky can be seen. If you want to observe something fainter than the sky, because the sky is already bright at 20, so anything fainter than 20, it is very difficult to do it from the ground. However, with dedicated observations from places like the Slow and Data Sky Survey, was able to go up to 21st magnitude and sometimes to even fainter levels. But if you do the observations from space, it is possible to go even fainter. I'll go through all these things as we progress. Now, as I said, there are two types of magnitude. One is the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude. Apparent magnitude means the observed magnitude. Because of the distance, a bright object may look fainter when it is at a distance from you. And the absolute magnitude is the magnitude of the object when it is at a fixed distance from you. So all these objects can be kept at a fixed distance of, say, 10 seconds, which is a unit for measuring distance in astronomy. And if you keep all the objects at a fixed distance, then the brightness will be related to the, uh, the, the apparent brightness that you see would be related to their absolute brightness. So you can fix it as the absolute brightness of the star and use it to compare their brightness, the energy that is coming out from them, etc. Then another important factor is the location. How will I find a star in the sky? You know that we have a comet now, and people speak about the location of the comet in the sky very precisely. At this hour of the day, you can see it in the sky. How is it possible? It is possible because you can consider the area on top of the top of you in the sky, the hemisphere that is there as a fixed surface. And you can fix a point called the vernal equinox, uh, which is a fixed, you just imagine that it's a fixed point in the sky. And from there, you can measure the angle towards your right side, which is called the right ascension. And also you can define an angle towards a horizon, which you call the declination. So the position of the star can be fixed, as you see here, can be fixed by both the RA and DEC values. So 
this is how astronomers are able to define the location of a point source in the sky or a star in the sky and this is the unit that they used to measure it then there is a frequency or the spectra of the object spectra consists of both absorption and emission lines absorption happens when light passes through a cold medium and emission happens when light is coming out of a hot media like a hot gas or a hot atmosphere that is around the sun or like that but most of the inside of the sun is hotter and as a result when you look at the sun or a star you find a lot of absorption lines from the atmosphere which is cooler than the sun which gets absorbed on the way so there are absorption and emission lines which is defined by the frequency or the spectra what is shown here is the spectra of a COSAR. COSAR is a cosy stellar object. I'll come to that later. But a COSAR has emission lines, which means that it has hot plasma around it in, the, in, the, in an area called the accretion disk, which is accreting matter to a black hole that is at the center of these COSARs. So that is the spectrum. Then there is also polarization. You know what polarization is. Can be Light can be either horizontally or vertically polarized. And that is also used for some of the analysis. And then in adaptive optics and places like that, you also consider the path difference of the objects for identifying the light coming from the objects for identifying the, uh, identifying the distortion they undergo when they pass through the Earth's atmosphere. Now, as I said, when light passes through Earth's atmosphere, we have several bottlenecks. One of them, the major one of it, is that when light passes through the Earth's atmosphere, it gets deformed. In fact, the deformation takes place in the wavefronts, which are flat, get distorted because of the fluctuations in the atmosphere. And as a result, Instead of getting stars as point objects, you get very Gaussian spreads, very blurred Gaussian spreads in your images when the observation is done from ground. So this is what is shown here by these humps here, which are in fact the light profiles of these stars. So these are two stars, but they seem to overlap here. These are two stars, they are not well separated here. The light regions of uh, the, the light profiles overlap which is a major bottleneck when you are doing observations from ground from the surface of earth but there is a way out which is to go to space well this is a very expensive procedure although is the only way to do it and this image that you see here is taken by the hubble space telescope and you can see a star here, which is saturating the pixels. So that is why it looks like a weird object. It is a star, just like a star here, here. All these are stars. This is also a star, but it is so bright that it saturates the CCD camera and makes it look very weird. So this is one practical difficulty. However, uh, the other major challenge is the expense. We have Hubble Space Telescope now in the sky. Successor to Hubble Space Telescope for about a decade now. It's very expensive and it is not very practical to do it. But of course, we are expecting within a year or so, the James Webb Telescope will go to space as a successor for Hubble Space Telescope and will be able to Tell us more about the universe that we live in. Well, is there any other alternative than going to space? I'll tell you about a mother that we developed at Ares 4D, where we use machine learning tools to deconvolve the Earth's base observations. But that will be described later in this talk. For the present, let us assume that it is very expensive and very difficult to do observations from space. And if only we do observations from space, we'll be able to differentiate 
two nearby stars, as you see here, into two different objects. So that is a, one of the limitations we face. For a long time, people thought that the universe is static with stars in their fixed positions in the sky. Thus, they arrange them in constellations that can be easily identified. This and turned out to be greatly helpful when they wanted to navigate through the sea or in through the wild or in a desert, where that, these stars could help them to find the direction. For example, you see Ulsa Major here, Ulsa Major, which is also called the Big Dipper. If you draw a straight line from here, that is always pointing towards the north. So you know where the north is, then you know the rest of the directions. And this was this was one of the reasons why these constellations became very handy. Then it also helped in predicting the seasons, because each of these constellations appear in the sky at a particular season, and people found it very convenient to predict seasons, predict whether it is going to have rain or whether it is going to snow or whether it is going to be of a particular season based on the constellations in the sky. In fact, astrology was developed based on this. What astrologers have here are the constellations, which is also called the zodiac. So what the zodiac says is that it tells you the location of the sun as seen from Earth. For example, if Earth is here and the sun is here, then I am, the sun is in the Virgo cluster. This is the constellation of Virgo. So I would say that in this particular time, the sun is in the Virgo cluster. But I can't see the Virgo during daytime because the sun is in front of me shining at a very bright, uh, shining very bright. But it is possible for me to see the Virgo cluster exactly six months later when the Earth is here. Because at midnight, 12 o'clock at night, Virgo will be right above my head because I am on the opposite side of the sun. So astrologers, in fact, use this mother to identify exactly where the sun is and name that as the constellation corresponding to the particular season or the period. I hope it is clear. Now, we know that the universe is not static. The stars are not fixed in the sky. They are all moving. But even before people realize that stars are moving, they were able to see moving stars in the sky and they were called wandering stars wandering stars means they are not fixed in the sky they are just moving around here and there in the sky and that is what the name planets mean planets mean wandering stars and these wandering stars they randomly move in the sky as you view planets from earth although planets are moving in very symmetric circles or elliptical orbits around the sun, they appear to be randomly moving because we are looking from the, at them from Earth, which is also moving along. It's just like looking at the cars that are running parallel to you when you are driving yourself on a uh, racetrack or some place like that. So that is how people realize that there are objects which are wandering around and are coming here uh, at different times to the sky as visible objects. <clears throat> now, in fact, the sun, which we think as the center of our solar system, also is not static. It is moving with a very high speed around our galaxy. And all the planets are spiraling around it, as you see here. So everything is in motion. We are not having a static universe at all. We are having a universe in which the stars are moving, the planets are moving, and we are on top of these planets moving along with them. And where are they going? They're going around this galaxy, 
which is our Milky Way galaxy. So you see this Milky Way galaxy with the sun here and all the stars that are here. And you can see the constellations that we talked about here. And you can see a bar-like structure at the center of the galaxy. This bar-like structure means that there was a collision sometime in the past. Galaxies collide with each other. And this collision, in fact, resulted in this bar structure. And we are waiting for a big collision to happen, which is going to be with the Andromeda galaxy. Our galaxy is going to collide with Andromeda galaxy in about a long time, 3.75 billion years, which is a time when you and I won't be here, which is a time when probably our sun will be in its old age. But on that day, after about 4 billion years, our galaxy Milky Way will collide with our nearest neighbor galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, and will merge together to form an elliptical galaxy. We do not know what will happen to life on this planet. Anyway, this planet won't be habitable at that, this, that time. Maybe we'll move to some other place or some of us will be lost. I mean, the life on the planet or the life on the life in the universe may undergo a drastic change following that collision. So this is all happening and we are all moving. Well, that's a long story which is going to happen only in 4 billion years. And we need not be concerned because we won't be there anyway. And people at that time may be intelligent enough to find a way out. We do not know. Well, but if we look at our own galaxy, the center of our own galaxy, things are not very quiet there either. If you look at the center, zoom into the center, you see that there are stars which are going around something which is invisible. And this invisible object is Sagittarius A, which is the black hole at the center of our own galaxy. So you can see that the stars are moving at very high speed around them. In the case of Sun, we are not even able to see that it is moving. But these stars are moving at very high speed, which means that the mass of the object at the center, which is invisible, is about a billion solar masses which is the only way in which the centripetal force, centrifugal force, can account for the fast movement that we observe here. What is happening there? There is a black hole at the center, which is stripping out the stars near it, eating them, and is, produce, is also gathering a lot of dust while it grows. So this is one of the latest observations we have made where we are able to find a black hole in the center of our galaxy. In fact, it is thought that, it is also understood that there is probably a black hole at the center of every galaxy in the universe. For example, this is the galaxy M87. You can see a bright point at the center of the galaxy. This whole thing is a galaxy and you can see a bright point at the center and a jet that is emitted from it. This galaxy is in the Virgo cluster, and you can see it somewhere here. Virgo is one of the constellations that we know, and you can find this galaxy there. But this picture was taken by Hubble Space Telescope, and only Hubble could see this, because it is in the space. So Hubble Space Telescope took the photo of this galaxy, which is about 5,000 light years, which has a jet of about 5,000 light years long. This is a huge jet that is coming out. Well, where is this energy coming from? It is coming from the accretion disk, which is the dust that is surrounding that region. And the black hole is eating up this dust. And as it eats up, because of, it's being pulled by the gravitational force at speeds comparable to the speed of light, it emits energy. And that is what you observe. Now, 
I'll come to something interesting. All these galactic nucleus, which are very active, are called active galactic nuclei or AG. So, Shailu Abraham, who is also your supervisor there, your teacher there, went on to do a Kosar hunt. So, I'll tell you a briefly about what this Kosar hunt was all about. What you see here is a Kosar, which was the first Kosar to be discovered in 1963. Its brightness is about of the 12th magnitude, 12 to 13 magnitude, and it is a nearby uh, Kosar at, the, at a redshift of about 0 0.158. And it's hosted, it is hosted by a galaxy, and it has a black hole which is at the center of that galaxy, which is the active galactic nuclei. And this particular cursor is really bright. It's about 10 raised to 12 times brighter than our sun. And it's about 10 times brighter than the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, which is our own galaxy. So where is this energy coming from? Hubble was able to look at this particular COSAR from the space telescope by hiding the central region. And they could see the host galaxy. You can see the galaxy in this picture. So this is the host galaxy of the COSAR. So the central region has the black hole, which is accreting matter from around, and is that energy which is coming out in the form of jets from the galaxy. And that is what makes it so bright. How do we know? We know that it is matter that is accreted at very high speeds because of the emission lines we see. As I mentioned before, emission lines are seen only when energy is produced in the source itself. So a heated filament, for example, heated if it is having a chemical in it, will have particular lines which are emission lines from it. So here you can see hydrogen, helium, oxygen, all these things there, which are there in the accretion disk. And because the accretion disk is being gathered towards the center by the black hole, which is sitting there, that is producing a lot of energy and emission lines from these elements are seen in the spectrum. So that is how we know that these are COSARs are active galactic nuclei and are produced by the accretion disk, which is being gathered by the black hole sitting at the center of the galaxy. Now for the COSAR hunt, Shilu Abraham went for data available from the slow and digital sky sun. Sloan Detail Sky Survey uses a 2.5 meter telescope at Apache Point in New Mexico and it attempts to capture the entire sky over several decades now. And it has a greatest redshift survey showing the web like structure of the universe. It has identified the largest number of cursors, has done a lot of spectroscopy on these objects. And they also do a lot of photometry. Photometry means you are taking images of the sky repeatedly and trying to understand the magnitudes of the stars, of the objects in the sky. They do this photometry in five bands. And those were the photometric information that was used by Shilu for doing the Kosar hunt. So when Shilu started her Kosar hunt, there were about uh, just about 100,000 COSAs known to us. So I must say that you should talk to Shilu, who is a local expert you have. You are lucky to have her with you and try to understand more about the wonders she found while doing this study. So as said, SDSS does imaging of objects in five bands labeled U, G, R, I, and C. The difference in the magnitudes
meaning u minus g, g minus r, r minus i, i minus z, etc., are called colors in astronomy. So in astronomy, color means the difference in magnitude in two different bands. And this difference in magnitudes was used to plot this graph that you see here, which is called the color color diagram. So you can see the u minus g on this axis. On this axis, x axis, you see u minus g. And on y axis, you see g minus r. And this is the distribution of all the objects with spectroscopic conformation that were available in SDSS DR7, data release 7, when Srilu Abram was doing her, project, her thesis, PhD thesis. So Srilu decided to study the objects that are shown in this box alone. Here, the blue and red objects are COSAs. They have a redshift of less than 3. In fact, the red objects are objects which have redshift greater than 3, which are moving on this line, which she did not use for the state. The green ones are main sequence stars, which are just like the star in our own galaxy. Uh, I mean, just like the star sun we have. And then the yellow ones are late stars, which are uh, reddish in color mostly. And these pink dots that you see here are galaxies. So all these are the spectroscopically confirmed objects that were available to Shilu during her PhD studies. And she took only objects in this region because her interest was to hunt for cosas. When you want to hunt for tigers, you go to a forest where tigers are there. So you identify the region. You won't go to the entire forest searching for tigers. Likewise, she identified a region where cosas are in large number and tried to uh, search for cosas there. And if you look at the completeness of her study, you find that her study was complete up to a redshift of 3. This axis is the redshift, which is a measure of distance. And this axis is a count. So you find that her study is complete up to redshift of 2.6 or 2.7. And afterwards, it differs widely, which is the reason why I said her study was confined to low redshift courses, which are bulk in number and which are the largest that are known. Because as the distance increases, it becomes more and more difficult to identify courses. Now, she did the study. And I must say that she was able to use about 100,000 COSAs that were spectroscopically confirmed in SDSS, which is this small box you see here, to discover about 2.4 million COSAs, probable COSAs, that are shown as blue in this region. The green are, again, stars. So she predicted them as stars. She predicted them as galaxies. She predicted them as uh, COSAs. So this catalog became available, which is the largest catalog even today for uh, this COSAR candidates. And interestingly enough, it was noted that her catalog was accurate up to 96% in most cases. To verify that, she did a cross study with about 34 or 35 different catalogs of COSARs. And as you can see here, she got an accuracy of 98, 100, 96, 100, almost close to 96% in almost all the cases, which confirmed that her prediction using a machine learning tool was very reliable. So as I said, this is the largest COSAR catalog available today. And is her paper is one of the early papers that show the application of machine learning tools that could support large sky surface. And even now, SDS is continuing its observation, and the accuracy of our predictions are still above 96% in the case of SDSS detections. So that's why I said you are lucky to have her with you as your teacher. Listen to her and try to understand more about what she did. Now let's move on. The universe is no longer static. We have a variable universe where everything changes. Look at this picture. 
you can say that the stars are fixed in the sky. But there is something that is becoming brighter and fainter with time in sky. And that's a variable star. A variable star varies its magnitude, its brightness, as time progresses. And as you see here, you can plot a graph showing how the magnitude varies as a function of time. So this axis is the time axis, which is days. And this is the Julian date that is plotted here, which is a way in which astronomers usually represent dates. And this is the magnitude. You can see that the magnitude goes high, magnitude goes low, high, low, go high, low, like that. In fact, two of the Rosa students at IRS are working on this problem. One is Lynn Abraham and the other is Sindhu. And what Sindhu does is she is trying to classify the objects into various groups. Like, for example, variable stars can be classified into two major groups the intrinsic variable group and the eccentric variable group. And this intrinsic group can be sub further subdivided into pulsating and eruptive. And the eclipsing groups can be subdivided into eclipsing binaries and rotating variables. Let's look at them. Eclipsing binaries are seen when you have two stars, there is a binary of stars in your line of sight. And because at one time of your observation, they'll be aligned in the same line, and you see only one of them. And when it turns to, uh, moves to the other direction, you see this particular star, and this is hidden from you. So you find that there is a dip in the curve because of the rotating binary which is in the direction of the line of sight of the observer, which is you who is sitting on the planet. So that is how eclipsing binaries are formed. You find a dip that is coming and going because of the rotating binaries in the line of sight. Then you have the rotating variables, which are, for example, our sun has sun spots. These are dark patches on the surface of sun. And because the sun is rotating on its own axis, these sunspots also rotate along. But the sunspots are very small compared to the size of the sun. They may be of the size of Earth or three to four times the size of Earth or even five times the size of Earth, but not big enough to see any visual expression. But you know that during sunspots, which is when the solar cycle, you have very different radiations coming from the quantity of light, the quantity of energy that is coming from the sun is different at each of the stand, which is what you mean by the 11 year periodicity in the sun sports or in the solar cycle. So when there are sun sports and when they are rotating around the sun, it will produce a dip in the light that is coming from the sun or the star that you are looking at. And that is what we mean by rotating variables. Now, coming to pulsating stars, sometimes it happens that the size of the star itself goes on change, or shape changes, it elongates and uh, becomes spherical in shape because of the huge amount of radiative reactions that are taking place inside. Now, our sun is also pulsating. Interesting. Our sun is also changing its size, but at a very slow pace. And in fact, researchers are studying this variability and it is called heliosesimology in uh, astronomy. So that is a study of the variation of the pulsating effects in the sun. And that is also when, when the size becomes larger, the brightness is spread on the surface and when the size becomes smaller, the brightness is on a smaller surface so it becomes more bright and because of this variation size, the brightness changes, and that is what pulsating stars are. Now, finally, we come to erupting, eruptive variables, which are mostly where in young stars, where you see all these novae. So 
these are when a young star is born it explodes several times and that is when you see this eruptive stars coming suddenly a star appears and disappears or there could be supernova as if you remember the slide that i showed before there could be supernova and that also can produce this kind of eruptive events now how you study them as i mentioned you can study them using the light curves so <clears throat> These light curves, as you see here, are very beautiful graphs showing how the light varies. And depending upon the shape, you can classify them into different types. I am not going into the details again, but these are all available. So what Sindhu is trying to do is to classify the objects into different classes based on these light curves. She is extracting parameters from them and is trying to classify them into one of these different classes based on the shape, the structure, and the variability of the light curves. Now, what Linear Brahm does is something one step ahead of this, where he's trying to find out the periodicity of these variable stars. The periodicity of these variable stars means with what period they are changing the shape or the, the light curves are occurring. This is important because that also defines the classes. In fact, if you look at the light curve, real light curve, it is a very challenging problem because you don't have so many points as you see in the other plot that I showed. Why? Because you can see the star only during night, which means that you, are, you have only observations in the night. You can see stars only in six months of any year because for the other six months you are facing the sun and the star is on the other side of the sky. So you won't be able to see them. So there are gaps in the observations and sometimes the sky may be cloudy which again produce gaps. Sometimes the sky may not be very good to see the uh, the seeing may not be good then you won't be able to take the observation. So it is a gappy data. And working on it is really challenging. In fact, it was more challenging in the past when telescopes were not as good as we have. And that is where we have to honor this Levitt, this Miss Levitt, who spent her entire life to understand one of the challenging problems given by her supervisor. She was an uh, MIT astronomer, one of her, uh, a challenging problem was given to her by her supervisor to find out the period of the stars that are varying. But she worked on it and she was able to come up with a formula which would say that there is a linear relationship between the absolute magnitude of the star and the period of its variability in the case of a few stars called Cifid variables. This was so remarkable a discovery that we should honor her when we honor Hubble for discovering that the universe is expanding. Because Hubble based his theory of the expansion of the universe just by observing stars in the Andromeda galaxy and the equation that Levitt put forward for understanding the distance to that particular galaxy. So when Hubble found that this particular star in the galaxy is much distant from the our own local galaxy Milky Way, he realized that it is a different universe or he called it the other universe or the, or the galaxy which is different from our own galaxy. And it was based on this remarkable discovery that Hubble showed that the universe is expanding. He looked at several other galaxies and the world war was favorable because the lights were off and sky was clear. He was able to look at many different galaxies, observe variable stars there, use this formula and show that the universe is expanding. Now we are going one step further and trying to classify 
different objects based on the period. And this is why the study of classification and determining the period is important. Because you find that based on the period you can define their class, CFIDs have periods varying from a, over a large range, which were the stars that Levitt used. And this RL array are stars which have variability, but within a small range. So classification helps in having a rough estimate of the period, which helps to estimate the period more reliably when you have a problem to handle. Now, that is not the end of story. We have also stars with planets around. For example, Jupiter is a big planet that is going around the sun. And if an extraterrestrial is looking at our sun with his telescope aligned with the uh, direction of Jupiter, he'll be able to see a dip in the light curve as you see here. In fact, Joe Philip Nainen, who is at Penn State, is working, who is also collaborating with us, is working on this project. And he's trying to identify new Earth-like planets outside our solar system. In fact, there are various ways to do this. And if you have adaptive optics, you'll be able to actually see the planets that are going around sun-like stars. And this is one example, which is an observation done in 2014 and 15, again shared by Joe Philip Nainan, which is called the HR879. And you can see the planets going around a sun-like star here. There are several thousands of star planets that have been uh, discovered so far. And if you, are, if you are interested in knowing about extraterrestrial planets, I encourage you to go to this NASA website of exoplanet archives and look for yourself and see the hundreds and thousands of confirmed planets that are already there outside our solar system. If, you, if in the future some of you are uh, planning to have a star trek, maybe you can go to one of these planets and stay there. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, let's come back. Earlier, I told you about a problem in which it is not easy to differentiate stars through observations that are terrestrial based on the surface of Earth, telescopes put on the surface of Earth. So this is a challenging issue when you are looking at the sky from Earth. And to solve this problem, we at ARS 4D, in collaboration with several researchers in the US and India and local, came up with a solution that could do this problem. Take the image from the, this is ZTF, which is one of the upcoming surveys for variability study. ZTF image taken from Earth and make images like this. It's the same image. If you look at the stars, the positions have not changed, but the shapes have changed, and they are different now. So you see that the star that was merged here is distinct here. And this is done using machine learning tools. You, I understand that you have a talk on machine learning soon, and you will be able to hear more about machine learning, power of machine learning tools. And this work was done in collaboration with Kaushal Sharma, who is a leading researcher in this work, Kausu Varme, Ajit Kambave, Andrew the Kambave, Joe Philip, uh, and uh, up to Ajit Kambave, who are at Ayuka Pune. Andrew the Kambave is in it's with Microsoft. Joe Philip Nainan is at Penn State University. Ashish Mahabal is at Caltech, and Ashwadi Charyan is at SRM University, Madras. These are the people who are working on it, and you can see that. The image could, in fact, get you something similar to what is observed from space. Will it solve our requirement to go to space for observation? Maybe to some extent for some problems, but may not for some others. Where precision may be lost when you do this kind of machine learning things. So this is a challenging problem. Work is still going on. We haven't published the paper but this is straight from the oven. 
this is just baked this is just the result we are discussing now i thought i'll tell you because you would like to know what is happening and where is the research going taking it well i must say that space technology and space research does not end in space if it end in space then it is not very really useful for us right because we humans live on this planet earth and we are concerned about the things that are happening here and if we talk only about space and things that you cannot see or you cannot reach then there is no point in talking about it. so let me tell you some of the examples or only one or two examples in which the space science research is directly being applied to real everyday science so here you see a few people blessan is leading this paper in fact this is a work that started with professor kambave janesh kidapol and myself who when we are at ayuka pune had a discussion with the national center for cell sciences there with ganesh and radha who are also in the picture uh, where we thought of using the techniques that are developed for machine learning developed in machine learning for detecting the stars for identifying the structure of rocks so these are very similar uh, things where you have in the sky the stars which are point like objects and here you have proteins which are spread on a wafer uh, that you want to uh, identify and robin and blessan are leading this work with Anishel from NCCS also contributing a lot to this work, and they are writing a paper which is expected to come in Nature within a few months. It is in the revision process. So, what is this exactly about? Let me explain. See, suppose you want to know the three-dimensional structure of a protein, and this three-dimensional structure of protein is very important because you define the structure of the drug that you need for a particular for binding a particular protein using this three dimensional structure so it is very important to you know the structure of the coronavirus for example is to be known for developing the vaccine that would be suitable for fighting it so how you do it you take a sample you dissolve it in some solution which is very convenient to float them and then you make a grid of it over a surface a slide like thing if you you talk to the biologist then you freeze it so that it becomes like glass it becomes very stable it won't change its shape it won't change its orientation once it is freeze using liquid nitrogen into a glass like stuff then you take it under the electron microscope electron microscope will be able to either scan the surface which you use with a scanning electron microscope which is called the sem or it can transmit electrons through the material which is called the tem or transmission emission microscope so either using any of these microscopes you will be able to do it but most of the time people prefer sem because that gives you a better image of the so this sem image is what is shown here and you can you may not be able to see anything in it but there are particles in it which are very small black dots in the Uh, which are the 2d projections of the three dimensional structure is you can imagine that you have a three dimensional structure and you are allowing light to fall on it and reflect back so that you depending upon the structure here you will have some images falling on the ccd camera and this two dimensional projections or the ccd images are shown here now what these people do is that they will try to pick up particles from it protein particles from it and align them so that they'll have a matrix of protein orientations which can then be used to find out the 3d structure this process is straightforward you only need to do an inverse fourier transform for doing that by doing an inverse fourier transform you'll be able to reconstruct the three dimensional structure and the model of the protein this is how the process is done but this process of picking up takes 2 to 3 weeks for the people to do it at nccs they have been doing it for a long time and it may take 3 weeks or even a month or more than a month for identifying the particles so 
this is the area where Brusson and Robin and the rest of the group has been trying to work on. What they try to do is they try to automate this process. They try to automate the process of detecting the particles in the 2D surface and creating this island 3D model. For that, they used a machine learning tool, which is called, uh, I mean, you don't have to go into the details, which is shown here. And what it does is, uh, it just picks up the particles that are shown in the image here and label them the proteins are labeled in red color so that they are detected. Now it can be easily aligned. And this whole process, which used to take two to three weeks, now takes less than a second, even a fraction of a second for doing the classification. So it immensely increased the speed with which this could be done. So this is just one example of the application of this astronomy tools, astronomy methods developed for the detection of stars or cosars or some other weird object in the sky for the detection of particles in proteins at a great speed. Now, coming to just another example, other than gravity, the basic and the most fundamental law that governs the universe is thermodynamics. And in thermodynamics, it's what makes the star stable. It's what makes the car run with petrol or whatever fuel that you use. In thermodynamics, you come across a term called entropy, which tells you how much information is contained in the particular object. Now, what Jinsu and Matthew did is she was able to demonstrate that this technology or this knowledge of entropy can be directly applied to natural language processing. So she is working on the thermodynamics of natural language. And in fact, she was able to demonstrate that as the same book, if you have a book written in one language, if it is translated to a different language, its entropy remains the same, which means that by checking the entropy, you can say whether it's a faithful translation or not. <laughs> How simple it is. You need not have to le learn the new language. And she also found that this entropy is independent of the language to which it is translated, which is remarkable. So if the information does not change with language, we are living in a world where we have to do with a lot of experiments on NLP related things. Because everything we come across, even uh, Google or whatever platform that you are using, Elsa or uh, whatever platform you are using is using a lot of NLP research. And of course, the future is going to be built around NLP because Everyone would like to speak rather than to type on the computer. So to develop a technology that is independent of language and the constraints it brings is of immense importance. And that is exactly what this, this research is doing. So to conclude, I want to tell you that when nature becomes your laboratory, the solutions that you develop are suitable for a wide variety of applications. And I want to conclude welcoming you to the world of science and to do wonders here. Thank you. If you have any questions, I can take a few of them. Or maybe you can give them in the chat box. Thank you, sir, for the talk. Uh, now, uh, the participants, if you have any doubts, please uh, uh, unmute yourself and then ask directly. Or you can directly uh, write the questions in the chat box.
sir uh, one one question I, i want to ask sir yes please sir sir uh, you are saying that uh, so many earth like planets are outside in our uh, solar system so uh, say same situation we can expect there also the um, oxygen content nitrogen this uh, this all all yes uh, we we are trying to study the atmosphere of many of these planets also by using specific spectroscopic methods and we have found planets which have oxygen which have water which have many things uh, favorable for life to exist and maybe we will be able to migrate to some of these planets also if technology develops to that level uh, but so far we are not able to see any form of life in any of these planets if that is the question you are asking okay. I hope all the participants are not sleeping. <laughs> sir, one 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 uh, general question I want to ask, sir. Uh, sir, yes. what is the percentage of accuracy of astrology, sir? If you are saying you have oh. mentioned about. <laughs> I I don't know whether there is at least one person possibility that astrology is true. <laughs> okay. Because because for plants and everything else, they depend on climate very much. and because this planets and this orientation of the stars in the sky is directly related to the climatic conditions on the planet meaning that the seasons on this planet their growth and their uh, everything may depend upon astrology very much but for humans and animals things are different we are not that dependent on the environment that we live in although we are also are dependent to some extent but that is to the local environment that we live in not to the position of the uh, stars in the sky or to the seasons that we have every year so i have no received i have tried to do this with the uh, help of some of my friends who believe in astrology but so far i was not able to see a single proof that made me believe that astrology could be true Sir, any math the mathematical what what is the uh, this mathematical calculations uh, about of astrology? Uh, astrology, any, astrology, astrology believes that the position of the star in the sky or the position of sun in the sky determines the fate of a person or the uh, fate of something that is on the planet Earth, which is. Uh, which has nothing to do with the stars there it is only like saying that if i am born at 12 o'clock in the night i have a certain car six because each star in the sky is just like the handle of your our clock and if the clock is pointing to a star you say it is 12 midnight or 12 at noon but whether it has a connection to what you are or to the evolution that you are going to have in life there is uh, absolutely no possibility for that to happen but if people think that it is likely it is something that can be studied so okay. far studies have proved it wrong okay sir uh, one more question just i have to ask sir uh, you are uh, saying uh, about um, our galaxy and andromeda galaxy will uh, collide after a certain billion of years yes. uh, similar type collision happened in earlier time Yes, uh, the, there have been several collisions in the past, but with, not with big galaxies like the Andromeda. Andromeda is much bigger than our Milky Way galaxy, so we can say that we are falling into Andromeda rather than saying that Andromeda is coming towards us. Although it appears that they are coming towards us because we are sitting in our Milky Way galaxy. But uh, this has happened before. Why we say that is when a galaxy is born, it is very much like a Uh, uh, this it has arms and it has a central region only it's very much like a spiral galaxy but our galaxy has an arm inside it which is also a work that shilu abram is doing uh, she has been able to identify galaxies with bars and all these galaxies with bars had at least one merger in the past with some other galaxy so our galaxy has been hit by several other galaxies in the past and the evidence is the bar that we see in the center of 
So one question in the chat box. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, he. I'm not sure the name. Seven eyes. It is written. Is it possible to travel inside a black hole? And could you please express your thoughts on black holes? Uh, it is possible to travel inside a black hole because once you are inside the black hole, it is just like the universe that you are in. And there, if you look at mathematically the possibility, you'll find that the universe that we are living in is very much like being inside a black hole. And there are people who argue that we are inside a black hole. Our entire universe is inside a black hole. And inside a black hole, situation is different. And you will never be able to escape from the black hole to see whether you are inside the black hole or outside. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, that is a situation. So black hole is, in fact, a singularity in mathematical terms where even light cannot escape. What happens is that when the mass of a star or a mass of a group of stars greater than the Chandrasekhar limit, it won't be able to remain as a neutron star. It will have to collapse and become a smaller star. A neutron star sometimes, a very uh, heavy neutron star sometimes, or may, if it is several times the Chandrasekhar limit, it may become a black hole. And this black hole, if, if our sun becomes a black hole, you can imagine that our sun can become a black hole if we can skew it to the size of a, uh, say, uh, a pebble or something like that, about a few centimeters. If the sun, how much big is the sun? If you take the earth and put it across it, the diameter of the sun will occupy 500 earths like planets. So it is that big. And if you suppose you skew it, so that it becomes small like a pebble, then it can become a black hole. And still all the planets will be able to go around it without knowing that it has become a black hole. Light won't escape from it, so you won't be able to see the sun there, but all the planets will go around. So there is no need to fear the black hole as such. But the black hole has the same gravity of that big object. And in that small size, the density will be very high, and light even won't be able to penetrate through it or escape from it. But if a light goes near it, it will bend, uh, depending upon the distance from the black hole. And at some point, it will go rotating around it and will fall into the black hole. So that is uh, what we know about black hole. It is a mathematical singularity. And inside the black hole, it's just like uh, being in our own universe. You won't be able to escape from this black hole. And if you look at it, there is an interesting experiment done by somebody who tried to compute the escape velocity from the universe. If you look at the escape velocity from the universe, it turns out to be equal to the velocity of light, which you cannot reach, which means that if you are inside a black hole, you will experience very much similar to what we experience today, and we won't be escaped from the universe that we are in. Hope I answered your question. Thank you, sir. Uh, I have a uh, simple request. Uh, sir, could you please explain uh, the uh, some of the basic applications which we use in the, our daily life, which involves these machine learning techniques like uh, our YouTube search or uh, prediction? Uh, I, I did not did not go specifically to machine learning because you have a separate talk on machine learning, and I thought that it would be covered there. But all these things you do in the sky have direct application in day-to-day uh, -day life. And machine learning is one of the most, uh, recently, it has become one of the most important branches of science, where you make the machine, uh, you train the machine so that it will be able to uh, answer queries, it will be able to answer uh, uh, problems which, are, which do not have direct solutions. For example, if you Google, you Google for something, you Google for somebody, it immediately takes you to the person's homepage or person's link or even information that you're searching for using machine learning tools. So what it does is that it, <coughs> it gathers all this data and it gathers all this data and use that information for, uh, for the analysis and processing of the uh, information that is uh, there in the system. Uh, so, uh, for example, when you make a Google query, <coughs> uh, 
what you are doing is that you are saying something and it is using an NLP, natural language processing technique, to search for all the data that is corresponding to that particular information. And only machines can do it so fast because when you see the result, you find that you have got 500 results in such a short time without having any difficulty, without having any need to wait. And each of these 500 answers are coming from 500 different clusters of machines. It's not coming from a single machine. It is coming from 500 different clusters of machine. They are ranked and they are grouped together and presented to you as a single page by <coughs> the machine learning tool. So that is one application in which machine learning tools are used. Then there is uh, these autonomous driving cars. Uh, they are able to respond much faster than humans and they are more reliable. The rockets that you send in space, they cannot be controlled from the ground station. They are controlled by onboard computers that use machine learning tools. So the applications in daily life are immense. If you uh, it, recently we have been working, in fact, I uh, spoke to you about the biology group that is working with us uh, under the guidance of Gita Paul and also some others who are working with her. They have been trying to use this for a lot of biology applications where you uh, try to identify objects which are underwater, for example, or uh, the plant leaves with, which have been infected by some species. You want to detect them and you want to apply pesticides exactly where it is required instead of spreading it all over and causing calamities like what happened in North Kerala, for example. Uh, this kind of things can be avoided if you use machine learning tools. So the, area and the applications are vast and wide. Okay. Two, two, three questions are there in the chat box, I think. Okay. Uh, so Jadin Govin has asked, uh, sir, we know that there is a uh, Goldilocks zone for the solar system which favors life. Is there such a zone for the Milky Way in general? Is life possible in only a certain part of a galaxy? Uh, in fact, we do not know what life is. We speak about life based on the carbon uh, form that we have here. And we do not know whether the life could exist in any other form. And in fact, there could be other forms of life which are not known to us which can exist in some other compound other than carbon. So uh, if you ask me specifically whether life of this kind can exist, it can exist anywhere on this galaxy, in any star. Because all these planets are formed when the stars are born. And when they, uh, during the formation, these planets also are formed with them. And depending upon the explosion and depending upon, some of the planets are also captured planets. And depending upon how these planets are formed, most of them have oxygen in them because when a star explodes in the form of a supernova, oxygen is one of the most common thing that is being generated. There. So it is believed that before our sun came to existence, there was a bigger star here which exploded and the sun was just a daughter uh, star formed with the, in the explosion. And the planets that we have here, including our Earth was formed during this time but these are all theories and they are all based on mathematical formulations which are to be uh, verified maybe in the future as we understand more but right now but right now we do not have evidences to say that there exists life anywhere else other than our planet earth we expect life to exist somewhere other places where there is a lot of water uh, but still, we do not know uh, whether it really exists anywhere else. <coughs> there is no such zone which is known to us. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, the next question is, is there a parallel universe? <laughs> By definition, universe means everything. So, uh, if there is a parallel universe, we will never know. Because we consider everything as universe. And anything that is unknown to us may exist, may not exist. It's just like uh, dreaming over something. Uh, theoretically, there is no reason why it should not exist because 
if we do not know whether big bang was a reason for the formation of our universe uh, there are evidences which are now making us rethink on the big bang model but <clears throat> so far big bang is considered the standard model is considered as the uh, theory of the universe and uh, if big bang can happen in one place it can happen in different places and there could be parallel universes but big bang by definition as i said it's like being inside a black hole you won't be able to see anything outside so even if parallel universes exist we will never be able to see them or interact with them okay sir uh, uh, next question is there is a concept that the origin of universe is from a black hole as you earlier mentioned every galaxy have a black hole in its center does that means the origin of universe was also from a black hole i do not know uh, how you came to the conclusion that the universe started with a black hole because a black hole is a very dense object and to form a dense object you need matter and if the matter is already there then there is uh, no point in talking about the formation of the universe because it is already there so uh, maybe it's something else but as i said if you are inside a black hole it will be very much like what we are experiencing now and you cannot say whether uh, uh, we are inside a black hole or we are outside a black hole or black hole is something else but so far every evidence shows that there is no other universe like ours and there is no way we can know whether there exists another universe and it's not true that we the universe started with a black hole and having a black hole at the center of every galaxy is a different story because when matter accretes they form stars first there are regions which form stars and when these stars are formed they attract matter and some of these stars becomes very massive and these massive stars burn out very fast and they explode and they cross the chandrasekhar limit and become small black holes then this black holes start spinning together merge together form bigger black holes and start attracting all the stars that are around them and forms the galaxy and that is why this spiral shape is coming there and at the center of most of these galaxies you have very supermassive black holes which is the theory that is prevailing now but uh, that is something we are still working on and it's only theory uh, thank you sir there uh, there are uh, four more questions uh, is it yes. possible to travel at the speed of light or more than that what about the theoretical particles like uh, tachyons it is possible to travel only at the speed of light and mathematically you can show that it is possible to travel at speeds higher than the speed of light which the tachyons have but if you are able to have if you if you find particles which are able to travel at fast speeds greater than the speed of light then those tachyons won't be able to slow down below the speed of light so it is just like two sides of a infinitely separated plane where you have the tachyons here you have the light particles here light particles have a speed of light and that is the maximum speed you can attain from this side and tachyons have a speed greater than the speed of light and that is a light the speed of light is a minimum speed you can have mathematically both can exist but they cannot talk to each other and they are separated by two different worlds and these are all perhaps some of the limitations of the mathematical models we create but that was what sudarshan said and uh, uh, sudarshan is right mathematically but we do not have any evidence to uh, believe whether he was right or not because we have no way to find out whether tachyon 6 is wrong okay thank you sir uh, next question is uh, so we know that uh, Uh, we know that thing that black hole can happen when a star is dying so as our sun is to a star when it will die uh, it to become a black hole and it uh, it's all our planets is it possible see the chandrasekhar limit says that the size of a star when it explodes when it ends its life should be at least 1.44 times the size of our sun to become 
to go to the next level where it may become a neutron star or something. So it has to be bigger than our sun. So our sun will never become a black hole, number one. Secondly, it will never become a neutron star either. It will end up as a white dwarf, which is which will happen about 5 billion years right from now. The sun has been here for 5 billion years now. It is a mid-age star and it will remain here for 5 billion years, 5 million years uh, before it ends its life. So, uh, so there is another 5 million years for sun to go and at the end of that it will become a red giant and will consume our earth also at when it becomes that big as a red giant and then will later become a white dwarf and end its life as a white dwarf or as a brown dwarf as its heat energy radius off. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, there are other questions also. Is it possible to make an artificial black hole? I told you one way to make an artificial black hole. You take the sun, which is about 110 times the in, in diameter, 110 times the size of our Earth, squeeze it into a size of a pebble which is a few centimeters in size and you have a black hole with you. So that is the uh, way to make a black hole. There is no direct way to skew sun to that size and there is no way to uh, make it that small because the repulsive force would be la that large. And that is the reason why you need a bigger sun, a bigger star than the sun which will be able to gravitationally pull its matter to such a small size and make a black hole when gravity becomes dominant and its energy in burning hydrogen empties out. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, next question is, uh, after the collision of Andromeda and Milky Way, what will happen to our solar system and the stellar clusters? All the celestial clusters will be gone. Our solar system may be there, but see, when two uh, galaxies collide, they do not directly collide, they do not collide like the collision between two cars because there is a lot of space between the galaxies. You know that our nearest star is about 4.2 light years away from us, which means that there is a lot of space. So when they go through the each other, they will strip apart everything. But it's just like throwing through two balls of water against each other. The entire system will be there, they will remain as water but will turn out to be a bigger bowl of water. Likewise, when galaxies merge, they pass through. You have seen that demo. They pass through one another. They pass through, they dance like that for some time and finally will become a, uh, uh, become a new galaxy which has an elliptical shape. And at that time, our solar system will be stripped apart. All the stars will be stripped apart, but will be somewhere, somewhere at a different location in the galaxy. Okay, sir. Uh, next question is: Some causes. Uh, why do some causes emit radio waves? Huh. Okay, causes are active galactic nuclei, and depending upon the accretion, the speed at which the matter is falling into the black hole, the energy of the radiation coming from them will be different. And energy can come out in all forms. There can be all these electromagnetic radiation and some of them will be in the radio band depending upon the energy some of the relics will be emitting relics means something that was emitted with high energy that spread into the sky and remain there as electric charged particles they'll be able to emit radio waves and that is the reason why you are seeing them as radio signals and one thing you need to understand is that radio signals and light signals have are directional they travel in straight lines so it depends upon their orientation in the sky, whether it reaches you or not. So even if all the COSAs re produce radio emissions, they need not reach you and they ne need not look like radio loud objects in the sky. So it depends upon uh, your orientation in the sky, the orientation of the object that you're looking at in the sky, whether you get a radio emission from it or not. And it also depends upon the accretion, the kind of accretion that is happening there. So some of the causes are known to be radio loud and some others are not radio loud. 
it all depends upon the accretion disk that surrounds her. The last question is, uh, can a spacecraft equipped with a wrap drive travel at speeds greater than light? Uh, nobody knows of such an aircraft. Uh, but uh, every impossible thing may have a possible solution. And if somebody believes that something like that is possible, they should think of it because it would be very helpful for people to travel at the speed of light or speeds greater than that of light to reach the nearest stars and galaxies. Okay, so one more question is there. Uh, lately, some experimental evidence prospects and the ambiguity in lambda CDM model of cosmology. Uh, what's you, your take on this? Thing? See, this is a totally different question from cosmology. I hope that there will be some cosmologists who will be able to uh, take classes on these things later and uh, they will explain these things on the cosmology. Perhaps Monsivi John, uh, who is now at the University, who worked on this lambda cosmology to a great extent, he may be able to answer this kind of question. I am not an expert in this. Thank you, sir. Uh, any other participants want to ask um, a question? You have uh, one more minute. Uh, if you want, you can directly unmute and ask. Otherwise, we will. Uh, we are going to uh, uh, close this uh, session soon with the uh, vote of thanks. I hope uh, you enjoyed the talk and you have learned a lot from this. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I would like to invite uh, 